right, so hi Andrew, it's really nice to have you with us today and I was wondering if before we get started you could just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're most passionate about at this moment. Sure, so really great to be here. Uh, my name is Andy Pershing, I'm the Vice President for Science with Climate Central and we're a climate science and climate communications organization based in Princeton, New Jersey. I think, you know, right now I'm, I'm really excited about about helping people understand what does it mean to live on a warming planet. It's just this reality that we have to confront. I don't think any of us like it very much, but there's just, you know, there's a lot that we need to do to understand what this means and how we can how we can do a better job living on this planet. Yeah, so are there certain areas of research that Climate Central is most focused on right now? I know uh, in the past, it's been those heat maps of cities and things like that. So is that where you see it continuing to go? Yeah, so a big thing that we're trying to do right now is to make a concerted push around climate change attribution. So this is a whole body of science where we try to connect the daily experience that people have through weather back to climate change. So we can actually put a number on any day's temperature anywhere in the world and tell you how uh, you know, how strongly that day's temperature has been influenced by climate change. And we think that's just, you know, a really important tool, again, for like localizing this experience. You know, we all talk about when we're talking about climate change, you know, 1.3 degrees C, 1.5 degrees C, and these like big global numbers. And that just doesn't mean very much to people, right? We We experience our daily weather. But we can actually detect that signal of global warming in uh, in daily weather, and that's a big part of what we're trying to develop right now. Great, um, and I know you work with local journalists and news stations across the country to try to do that work. So, do you feel like um, there's an openness to making those connections? I think you know more and more, you know more and more, and I I'm just really impressed by the quality of climate reporting that we're starting to see around the country. Um, you know, like if you look at the some of the surveys that Yale University does, like every every about I think it's every six months, they survey the United States around attitudes and experience about climate change. One of the things that really comes out is like the majority of people, even in places, you know, even in very like red places that you think are not going to be very receptive to climate change. They're concerned about it. They're worried about it. They see their world changing and they want to know more. There's just a real curiosity um, and I think there's a real, there's a really interesting blocker that a lot of people have. Everybody assumes that they're the only one who's worried about it. And so we don't talk about it. And so then it doesn't get discussed. And I think it's a, it's a reason why we haven't made as much progress as I'd like. Yeah. Um, and I know one of the things that you also study are marine species and ecosystems and also the impact of climate change on non-human animals. So is there a similar maybe resistance to conversation around bringing other species into the conversation? Well, uh, uh, you mean with the like with media here in the U.S. or with like so with, with what? Where? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think huh. I think maybe on both fronts. So first, in terms of climate change research, obviously the most pressing issue is you know the human impact, the loss of life, how our our um, our daily lives might change. Um, so sometimes it feels like maybe there isn't room to talk about how it's impacting other creatures. Um, and then also are those same groups of people maybe closed off to discussing, um, to reporting on climate stories in terms of animals on local stations and. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think a big, a big barrier is just, you know, the time in a news broadcast, right? You've got to get, you've got to get your stuff out there, especially like if there's a big, you know, storm coming through, that's going to eat up a hundred percent of what, you know, for example, the weather broadcast is going to be. And that's often where the science lives in, in like a local TV broadcast, but I think animals and nature are actually a really great opening for talking about climate with people. You know, I think everybody has the things they care about, but, you know, there are a lot of people who, you know, who are, you know, who are bird, who fish, who hunt, right, who like to hike, right? And nature is, a, is something that's very resonant with them and they see it changing, uh, you know, changing around them. And so this is an opportunity to talk about what's really driving those changes. And um, in particular for marine ecosystems, what are the changes that you're seeing in the research? I, I think what's really hard to convey to people who don't spend a lot of time, you know, in the ocean, looking at data in the ocean, thinking about the ocean is just how 
strongly the signal of climate change is appearing in, in the ocean. And that's because the ocean just integrates warming in a way that the air, you know, that we that we experience doesn't. And so you just get these much clearer climate signals when you're looking at at data in the ocean. So you know the big the big things that we that we see when we you know when people are looking around uh, you know at ocean data is you know northward or poleward movement of species in response to warming. So you know for example in the Gulf of Maine where I spent a lot of time, uh, there are now species there that used to be you know found off of you know Rhode Island off of New Jersey right are now regularly a part of that ecosystem and so that's a that's becoming a very different ecosystem than it was, you know, even, even a couple of decades ago. I think the one, the one ecosystem that you could really put out there and say that, you know, this is a, this is an ecosystem that, that climate change is just radically transforming. Uh, and that's coral reefs. And this was something we called out in the national climate assessment a few years ago that, you know, coral reefs are, you know, they're very, they just, it's a huge sources of biodiversity, right? They're beautiful. They have lots of species that are hanging out there and everything is built on the coral animal, right? These kind of funny animals that build these calcium carbonate shells. When the water gets too warm, the coral bleach, they lose their color. They lose the, the single celled algae that they're using as food. Uh, and that can be very, um, very stressful then to the whole ecosystem. And so you're really seeing in a lot of places, you know, the loss of coral, Coral getting replaced by, you know, by different seaweeds that aren't as pretty. They aren't as, um, you know, they aren't as good of habitat for the, some of the fish and invertebrates that are living in the reefs. And that's one where you, you, once you lose them, it's really hard to get them back. It takes, you know, decades to centuries in order for a coral reef to grow back. Yeah. And is all of that change happening from the warming oceans? Or are, are, is the fishing industry also impacting those shifts? There, it, it's a fabulous question. So, you know, when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about the fish species, the shifts are really being driven by the, by the warming, but how many fish you have, how healthy those stocks are, depends a lot on fishing. And so, you know, that was something we were, we were doing a lot of work on in the Gulf of Maine and just showing that like, you know, cod were becoming more and more stressed because of the warming water. And the fishery management process, had, we actually have really great fishery management in the United States. It's it's something I think most people don't appreciate. Like we are really, really good at this. We invented it. We've figured it out. We've like rebuilt a lot of our fisheries. But, you know, cod, even though we were using like some of the state-of-the-art uh, kinds of techniques and strategies for managing stocks, Basically, we could not keep up with how quickly that stock was changing. And so you ended up in this situation where you were working so hard not to overfish, but you ended up overfishing anyway. Um, and that's just one of these challenges of just, you know, how do you how do you manage nature in, in you know, as it's changing? Um, and then, you know, for, you know, for coral, the the it you know it depends a lot on where you are in the world, but any you know traditionally the big threats to coral reefs have been you know basically building on land. So if you if you have you know dirty water that's going into the coast, that's gonna that's gonna really um, you know damage the reefs. If you have you know buildings on shore or a lot of tourists, like you know that can damage the reefs. But you know those are things that you can control, right? But now we're just seeing this this pressure on all reefs everywhere in the world, even ones that are very remote. And you still see bleaching in those in some of those very remote reefs if they get warm enough. Yeah. Uh, is one of the solutions that feels um, sustainable to move away from relying on the oceans for food or for fishing? Or do you think that there's too many like precarious communities who rely on that for food to to really suggest that shift. Yeah, I I think that you know it is possible to, you know, to use the ocean and to get sustainable food out of the ocean. You know, I think you and and I think we've gotten better at that, especially in in the United States and, you know, in Europe, I think are are starting to do a much better job managing their fisheries and and you know, having fishing relate to conservation. So being able to like have fishing and also have, you know, natural areas that you set aside that allow, you know, more kind of more natural ecosystems to, to persist. 
Um, so I, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's as simple as not, as not fishing. I think we need to be able to fish smarter. I think that's really important in, especially in the developing world where you may have fewer regulations. Um, it's very important in, you know, for some of the larger countries like, you know, China, uh, you know, collects a lot of fish and they're, you know, it has uh, the same kind of international challenges that we had, you know, we hear about on the news around China appear in kind of fishery management as well. Great. Um, and I was, I know before we started the recording, we were talking about wind and I didn't realize how wind also impacts underwater species like whales. Um, so I was just curious if you could walk us through what's exciting about <laughs> the wind research. Yeah, so yeah. absolutely. So, you know, I think I start from the point of view where if you look at at where we need to be like in, you know, in, in 10 years, 20 years down the road, if we want to limit warming to something that's going to be, you know, that's going to something that we can manage, right? Um, we need a lot of clean energy, clean energy, renewable energy, you know, solar and wind takes a lot of space and the oceans have a lot of space. Uh, and so, you know, the Europeans de uh, developed the first offshore wind sites uh, in some of the shallow areas off of the Netherlands and off of Denmark. And then it, we're, we're starting to see that technology now in the US in places like Rhode Island and Delaware and New Jersey. And then now there's also interest in having uh, floating offshore wind where you can go into deeper water uh, like you'll find off of Maine. And the so, you know, when you're thinking about wind, it's it's just, it's really interesting. So, you know, there's obviously concerns about uh, you know, about flying animals. So birds and surprisingly bats <laughs> interacting <laughs> with the, you know, with the wind turbines. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to put those in places where you're not going to, you know, not going to be impacting a very sensitive population. Um, but, you know, your the, the experience in Europe is like, you, you can, you can kind of figure that out. Like you can work on that. And it, this is, this is by no means the biggest threat to, you know, to birds, for example, like you're, you know, Glass, you know, shiny buildings and cities kill a lot more birds, and the biggest, uh, you know, human-related uh, deaths for birds are cats, right? <laughs> Domestic cats that are out in the wild kill a lot, a lot, a lot of birds. So, so there's kind of a perspective there. When you're thinking about like animals in the water, the main, the main thing that that you that you get is that um, you often have to disturb the bottom, and so anything that's living on the bottom is going to get disturbed. Uh, but then you also, by putting something there, you also are creating habitat. And so the, you know, the Europeans have done work to show that you can actually, in some ways, these these um, wind, you know, wind farms can actually function like uh, like marine protected areas because you can actually get fish sort of living in among that uh, in that habitat. Um, there are concerns for uh, for marine mammals, so whales uh, especially, because wind turbines right produce noise so they have kind of a low frequency noise that uh you know people have wondered whether that could disturb whales um that doesn't seem to be as you know as big of an issue and i think you know for me it like the the big issue that you know that whales are facing is climate change and so like it's 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 just a much you know it's a it's a much greater threat than than you know the impacts that we're seeing from you know from wind turbines so um, do you feel like there's still a good option to move forward? Are there other kinds of climate technology that you're um, that you would ask to use first or what's your fault? Oh, yeah, no, I actually I I think that this technology, I think, you know, the the offshore wind is actually, I think, quite compatible with ocean conservation. I think mm -hmm. it's I think it works, you know, really well. You have to be smart. Like you don't want to go, you know, put wind turbines on the Great Barrier Reef, right? <laughs> you want to, you know, you don't want to put them in like an important, you know, spawning ground for a fish or, you know, a breeding area for whales. Like, you know, want you want to be sensitive there, but, but you know, you can you can do this, and I think that this is something that, you know, that we're going to have to do, and it it's, I I think it's quite compatible with it, you know, with the animal life that that we have in the ocean. Great. Um, I'm curious to just think in general about the kind of mission of Climate Central and the work that you're doing. And um, for those who are listening, who are maybe artists or storytellers or, or even journalists, what are the ways that they can bring um, their work in conversation with climate uh, 
Yeah. I am. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked <laughs> that. Cause I, I think like communicating is probably the number one climate solution that we have. And the, the most impactful thing that an individual can do is to talk about climate change. So, you know, I mentioned the, the Yale survey earlier, right? We see this communication gap in that survey that people want to know about climate change, but they don't talk about it. And they don't talk about it because they, they don't think anybody else wants to hear about it. They don't think anybody else cares. And so we're all kind of are locked into our own heads, I think, a little bit. And we carry that, that worry with us. Uh, and I think there's just a lot of value in, you know, in sharing, you know, how we're feeling about it, how we're thinking about it, sharing what we're concerned about, because the only way you can solve a problem is if we're going to do it together. And, and I think we need to just have that, you know, just have a richer conversation because it's touching every aspect of our life right now. And it's only going to get more and more intense. Yeah. And do you feel like you've seen, um, citizens or uh, viewers even of of different weather channel news stations are they the ones asking for the stories ever or is it always kind of the reverse because i'm just wondering other ways that we can pressure our local <laughs> our local news to like do more climate reporting so i uh, yeah so we we work directly with uh with a lot of you know tv meteorologists that's a really important uh, group of partners for us mm -hmm. and you know they are they're an amazing group and they are so active on social media it's it, you know it's a it's a job requirement for them to like be on facebook and you know and the other platforms and and you know they take that seriously so one of the things that we've heard from them is like they get very little they're they're always surprised by how little pushback they get when they share climate change if anything they get very positive feedback when they do talk about you know warming in their area or you know, the relationship between climate change and extreme rainfall, right? Um, they tend to get very good feedback. And so, yeah, I think, you know, that's a great way to to interact with them. Um, and I think, I think we're all looking for stories of how climate change is touching, you know, daily lives. Like, how does it, how is it affecting, you know, kids when they're going back to school? How does it affect, you know, um, you know, sports teams uh, out in the world. How does it affect, you know, and uh, Minnesota has been incredibly warm this year. And so what's the, been the impact on, you know, on ice fishing, right? Or on other kind of traditional winter recreation in that area. Um, I think those are great stories that, you know, I would love to see people start to tell. Yeah, I think making the, showing like, you know, the lo the local loves are at risk. <laughs> um I wonder, I know one of my hesitations as a writer um, is often talking about the causes or the, the sources, um, in particular, the food industry and um, the impacts of agriculture. And so um, I don't know if that's something you feel comfortable speaking to, but do you think that that is part of the conversation, looking more at the sources as a public, or is it really just focusing more on the loss that's currently happening? I I think I think we need to have good conversations about about solutions and I think the challenge is how to have that in a way that is kind of productive and and invites people in rather than a way that seems judgmental. I mean there is a lot of judgment to go around yes. you know with you know with climate change but you know there's a there's been a lot of things that have happened that are you know that that you know I think people people of goodwill like are are really trying and think they're doing something good and and you know it's not turning out that way and i think that a lot of that is in you know in agriculture mm -hmm. and so i think finding ways to you know engage with that community show that you know different um you know the different ways of you know of growing crops can have a better you know outcome can be you know as productive or more and like lead to better soil health you know better habitat for animals like that's there, there's, there's story. There's a way to tell that story that can be very negative, and there's a way to tell that story that I think can be very positive, and really kind of invite people in, which I, I, I feel is more effective. Um, even though, boy, there are days I want everybody to feel <laughs> my pain and. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it makes me personally feel good that you seem to have so much optimism and to be solution focused because I think. Um, there are a lot, you know, there is a lot to dread. <laughs> um, so do you overall think that there's there's hope or that you see a lot of interest in advancing solutions? 
I I think that I, I think one of the one of the lines of thinking that I think is very that leads to leads to people ending in a very hopeless place is if you focus on like a particular target or a particular year and say like if you know if we don't do this then you know then it's game over that's not really how this works that's not how climate change works every you know every tenth of a degree matters so every tenth of a degree we inch up higher increases the risks and the challenges and every tenth of a degree of warming that we avoid you know decreases our risks and makes life better and so i just i tend to just really try to focus on the on the the fight and yeah, I'm, you know, I'm really disappointed. I was, you know, I was at COP, you know, COP28 in Dubai, and that was super weird. And, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, many, you know, very, you just really saw the kind of the challenges of this problem, like, you know, it's just like beating you in the face every day. But, you know, we've seen great progress here in the US, like we're starting to see, you know, a lot more wind and solar, a lot more investment in, you know, in renewable technology and, you know, in power grids and, you know, con and concerns about biodiversity, right? Like preserving, you know, more land, more areas in the ocean. Like there's a lot that that's going well. And we just, I think we just need to lean into those and, you know, and, and we will have a better outcome than if we, if we hold back. Yeah. Um, were there any uh, talks in particular at Dubai that you wanted to speak to, or was it just sort of a general feeling of that space? Yeah, I mean, it was a general feeling of that space, just like this kind of cognitive dissonance of like having everybody together, like trying to like work together to solve this like grand global problem of climate change and then just be surrounded by all of this wealth from the, you know, from fossil fuels and just to realize like how much wealth and power there is with people that, uh, you know, that are in the kind of fossil fuel industry, fossil fuel countries, and just how hard it's going to be to kind of unwind uh, that, you know, that dependence. Yeah. Um, this is something I've heard a couple other researchers talk about was watching the response to um, COVID, even though there was a lot that didn't go right, but overall, like how quickly people shifted, you know, into some behavioral change. And um, there was a lot of comparisons being made to like, oh, this could be an indicator of how we could come together to like respond to climate. But my feeling was, oh, well, does it have to be like an act of catastrophe like that in order to get the behavior change? Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, that's yeah. something we think about a lot, right? Because we, yeah. we spend a lot of time thinking about extreme weather and climate change. And, you know, the goal, the goal of the whole like weather forecasting community is, is to avoid all of the bad outcomes, right? To give people time to prepare and to save lives. And, you know, it, it doesn't, it's, you know, the same thing is true around climate. Like we really want people to feel warned and feel like they have things that they can do to keep themselves and their families safe, you know, with bigger storms, with, you know, wilder weather, with hotter, you know, bigger, hotter heat waves. Um, and yeah. And so it's, 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 it's really challenging. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious, just before we go, are there any projects that you're working on right now or research that you're doing that you feel um, interested in sharing or just excited about? Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm really actually really excited about some of the work that we're doing on some ocean temperature stuff. So we, Climate Central has traditionally done work on land. We've done a lot of work around, uh, you know, around weather impacts, you know, quite a bit of work on sea level rise, but that's like ocean meets the land. Uh, we're actually doing some work on ocean temperature trends, trying to do this kind of daily climate change attribution um, around ocean temperatures, and then tr looking at, at using that as a way to talk about impacts in the ocean. So we're going to probably be doing some work on, on you know, the, the climate sensitivity uh, around coral bleaching, and also probably climate, you know, climate change influence on uh, on hurricanes. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm excited to see that. <laughs> um, so what are ways people can get involved or in touch with the work that Climate Central is doing if they're feeling called after this? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, climatecentral.org is our website. And there are a few, you know, a few things you can do there. Uh, there are a number of, uh, you can sign up for our Climate Matters, uh, which is our weekly clim uh, climate change bulletin uh, that we put out uh, to help, uh, help, you know, tell the story of climate change in the United States. And we have a real-time climate alert service that you can sign up for, where you can get alerts when there's a weather event that has a, you know, that is related to climate change going on in your area. 
Um, and then, you know, if people are, are feeling very generous, there's also a donate button, I'm sure somewhere on there and <laughs> I'd love to have your support, but uh, more than anything, we'd love to have you care. And I just, you know, I can't under I can't say it enough, like talk about it, talk about it with your friends, talk about it with your family. It's just, it just has to be as normal as talking about the weather. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad that you're making those connections for folks and that we, ha you know, there's so many people there who care. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. This is fun.